Welcome back. Welcome to, this is chapter two, um, part two of chapter two, book of James in our Bible study. Um, if you haven't already done so, once again, I'd like you to pause the video and read the second chapter of the book of James to give a, you a good overview once again before we get into this. So you have an idea of where, what we're talking about, where we're talking about. So do that now if you haven't already done so. Okay, so I assume everybody has already read through the second chapter of the book of James. And actually, each week you should be reading through the entire book. It's only five chapters. doesn't take very long to read. But as we had uh, said last week and prior, that the book of James is to the New Testament what the book of Proverbs is to the Old Testament. In other words, it's, it's a book filled with wisdom. And the more you read it, the more of that wisdom you, uh, you learn, you take upon yourself, and the more of it you can actually live out. So it's a good book to read and reread, study, and, and really get to know. I want to do just a brief recap from last, our last week's uh, um, study. We ended with, I believe it was verse 14, but verse 12 and 13 says this, this is the second chapter of the book of James. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. As we looked at this, the law of liberty, and it's also called the royal law. James calls the law, the royal law, and also the law of liberty. But here in verse 12, he says law of liberty. The uh, word liberty and the word mercy in verse 13 are very much related to each other. So he is, James is saying that the law, the Torah, is, is the law of, as he says, or as it's translated here, liberty or mercy and freedom, mercy and liberty. And I find that very interesting again, as we spoke about last week, but I find it very interesting that many see the law as something that's binding, restrictive, and doesn't give you freedom. But James, the brother of Jesus, sees it differently. And I think, again, we need to start really seeing things the way the Bible says it is, not what preachers today say it is. Many are trying to say the law is bad, it's done away with, it's passed away, it's binding, and that's not what the Bible teaches at all. So let's start looking at these things the way God looks at them and the way he sees them. So I just wanted to touch upon that again because the law of mercy or the law of liberty, uh, he says, so speak and so do as those who will be judged. We have to understand, we have to, we have to understand that we will be judged by the law. But depending upon how we face the law and view the law and walk the law, it, that's how it's going to be, uh, uh, that's how we're going to be judged by the law. In other words, when we extend mercy to others, and even including to ourselves, mercy will be extended to us, and mercy triumphs over judgment. Now the word, uh, or the idea of judgment there, isn't just making a decision per se, as much as the conviction of, of uh, you know, the conviction of that judgment. So mercy tri triumphs over that. If we have shown mercy, then we receive mercy. So that's what James is alluding to and talking about there. So if you approach and face the law as a law of liberty and mercy, then we will receive mercy when we are being judged. Okay, so keep that in mind. <clears throat> now we'll pick up verse 14. And... From uh, verse 14 on in this book, it really gets interesting because it speaks about faith and faith in works. And again, as we look in past studies, we see that law and grace, at least biblically, are not at odds with one another. We see in this study that Paul, and we're going to look at this a little bit more today, but Paul and James are not at odds with one another like many have taught. And we see that works... And, and faith are not at odds with one another. I just want to throw that out be, before we get into this so you'll see this. But verse 14, chapter 2, verse 14, book of James, 
It says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Now, when we look at that question, can faith save him, well, we would say, well, yes. Well, wait a minute. We have to get into this a little bit more because James asks the question in such a way that demands an answer, not just, not just a passing answer. Well, yeah, faith can save him. And we go on. He asked it for a reason because he, he, before that, he asked this question, uh, or he, he asked this question, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? So those two questions go hand in hand. Uh, and they must be answered so that we get a broader understanding of faith and works and what that means. So again, remember that James is pointing out that faith is recognized <clears throat> uh, by a corresponding action, a work. A work is a corresponding action, action, putting, you know, doing something. You understand that somebody has faith by what they do. You can see their faith in action by what they do. Uh, l let me just throw this out. There will be people that, you know, make a decision for Christ, uh, say the sinner's prayer. Maybe they've even served God for a while. And they might say something like, I, have, I know God can uh, heal people or deliver people from bondages and, and addictions. Okay, I believe that. Well, that faith doesn't mean anything if that person that says that it still bound in addiction. Think about it. Faith without a corresponding action, without the work, is dead. The work would be overcoming the issue that you claim to have faith in, at least in this regard. So James asks this question, what does it profit, my brethren, uh, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? Where's the profit in that? Think about a business in, in, in a sense. You know, where's the profit? Where's the increase? Where's the return? If someone says they have faith, um, but they don't have works, saying that you believe something, but not acting upon it, or uh, saying you believe something, but not acting upon what you say you believe, is worthless. Again, I believe God can break addictions, but if I'm addicted, that's worthless. My testimony or what I claim to have faith in is worthless if I'm not living it out, if I'm not walking it out, if I'm not experiencing it, if I'm not living it. Uh, so, so James takes this idea to the point even of salvation, because he says, can, say, uh, can faith save him? He takes it to the point of salvation by following up with this question. Remember the original question, but he follows up the original question with, can faith save him? Now, again, we would say sometimes, well, yes. But think about it for just a moment. Faith without some corresponding action cannot save a person. <laughs> we would automatically say yes, because sometimes we, you know, we would quote the writings of Paul and what he had said. But remember, Paul and James are not in opposition to one another. So we have to take a deeper look. We have to look a little bit further, not just with Paul, but also with James to understand this thing. So remember that James is pointing out that faith is recognized by corresponding action or a work. A work is simply doing what one says they believe or where they have their faith. So he asks the question, what does it profit? My brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, saying that you believe something but not acting upon that belief is worthless. I know I already said that, but I want to point, I want to push this. When you say that you believe something, but you don't act on it, it's worthless. In other words, you're, if it really honestly is faith, it's a faith that cannot be proven, and it, and it doesn't profit or benefit anyone, including yourself. Um, and again, he takes this to the point of uh, salvation. Now I'm here, many have a hard time understanding the point James is trying to make. Here it seems as if James and Paul are at odds. In their teachings on faith, works, and salvation, a closer look proves that Paul and James are not at odds at all. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Romans chapter 4, and we're going to read from verses 1 through 4. If you want to pause this to catch up, you can. Otherwise, I'm going to read it. 
But James, or I'm sorry, Romans, Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 4 says this. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham, listen to this, was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Now that sounds like they're contradicting one another, what James says and what, what Paul says. But again, I want to say there are no contradictions in the word of God, only in us. So in our understanding. So we, if we see something that looks like a contradiction, we better look deeper and find the truth. But aha, we're going to do that. <clears throat> so James, James writes this, James chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. Now we're going to get there again as we go down, but I wanted to pull on this to tie these all together. So in James chapter 2, verses 23 and 24 says, The scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the, fr the friend of God. Okay, so let me just stop right there for a moment. So Paul, in Romans 4, verse 3, quotes the same passage that James quotes in chapter 2, verse 23. Okay, they both quote, Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. Paul goes on to say, now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as a debt. Uh, and he also says that in verse 2, Abraham was just, was not, if, if Abraham was justified by works, he has nothing to boast about, especially before God. Okay, so, so um, we see that Abraham believed God, it was counted for him righteous, and works had nothing to do with it in this regard, as Paul's pointing it out. James comes along and says in verse 23, chapter 2, verse 23, Abraham believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness. He was called a friend of God. Verse 24 goes on to say, you see then that a man is justified by works, not by faith only. Now, again, we stop and go, see, they are contradicting. No, they're not. Listen, what came first, the faith or the work? Now, let's take it down to right to the passage that Paul and James are both dealing with. It says very clearly, and this is, is taken from the Old Testament, taken from the story uh, where Abraham believed God. And it says, Abraham believed God. It was accounted to him for righteousness. So it's in the Old Testament and at least twice in the New Testament. I think it's up places, other places, but at least twice. Paul says works didn't have any, anything to do with it. It was his faith. James says it was his works and not faith only. Now, let me look. That's why I asked the question, what came first, the faith or the work? Because that's the part that's very important. See, when we talk about in, in regards to faith versus, versus works, we're talking more about which is first. Are you working to try to have faith or working to please God? Or do you already have faith in God which pleases him and now you're working out your faith? See, that's all that James is saying. The faith or the belief comes first, then a course, then afterwards a corresponding action. You see, where we get it wrong is where we have the corresponding action first and we expect faith to line up afterwards. And that's where we get off. And that's what Paul is referring to. If you're going to work first and try to please God with a work, you've missed it. You have to first have faith and that pleases God. And then out of that, out of that place of faith and God already being pleased, you do the corresponding action. See, so when, when God asked, because this where it says Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. That was all in regards to the story of Abraham offering Isaac on the altar. Okay, so he has a relationship with God first. He's a friend of God first. He has faith in God first. 
then God says, I want you to sacrifice your son. And he's obedient to God because of his faith in God. And he takes his son Isaac on the mountain to sacrifice him. You see, the corresponding action came after the faith, the friendship and the relationship. But the corresponding action was what proved his faith. Does that make sense? I hope you got that. They're not in opposition at all. Because Paul understood that, that Abraham went uh, to sacrifice his son. He understood there was a corresponding action. What he is saying, oh, he didn't, he didn't like hear about this God, Yahweh, and go, I'm going to offer my, my son to him and hope that he looks favorably at me. He said, no, he had a relationship with him first. God already looked favorably at him. And because of that, he was obedient when God spoke. You see, if it's the other way around, you know, that's why all these other religions where they come and sacrifice to these false gods, they have it completely backwards. They bring the sacrifice or do the work first and then hope their false god, their god, looks at them favorably. We already have God's favor. We already have his love. He is already our friend. So we do the corresponding action or the work because of our faith in God. It's not for faith, it's because of faith. So always remember that. It, we sometimes get it backwards. We sometimes miss it. We put the cart before the horse, so to speak. And then we wonder, you know, and then we get all messed up when we read things of Paul and we read things of James. And then we hear somebody say, oh, they're in opposition. James shouldn't even be in the Bible. And that's nonsense. We just got to get past the carnal surface look at this stuff. Because I'll just be honest with you. Here's the thing that, that, that I see and that bothers me and concerns me in the body of Christ. Because I've actually heard preachers say the book of James probably shouldn't be in the canon of Scripture because it's against what Paul wrote. <clears throat> and, I, and, and when I first heard that, it stunned me because, you know, I grew up believing that all 66 books were supposed to be in the Bible, were the Word of God, and we just have to believe in them. And then when I get into the study of it to try to figure out what he is saying, and I realize it wasn't just one one preacher saying that, but that's a train of thought in, in many, uh, uh, many camps <clears throat> throughout history, actually. It made me realize, because I got to study and I got to begin to see this and see how it all played out, and I realized, wait a minute, they're facing it carnally. Now remember, the Bible tells us that the Word of God itself is you have to have the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to reveal it to you. Spiritually discerned, as one translation says it. So if you're not spiritual, if you're not awake spiritually, if you're not saved, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, and you're not hearing the Holy Spirit, you're not going to understand this book. Okay, now think about it. So if, if we understand that the Holy Spirit, having a relationship with Him and hearing and receiving revelation from the Spirit is the key to understanding the Word of God. And then we hear some knucklehead saying, the book of James shouldn't even be in the Bible. Well, then that tells me that that person has no relationship with the Holy Spirit because they can't understand how the book of James and the writing of Paul go hand in hand. They're not opposed to one another. They fit hand in glove. And there's no problem with them. As a matter of fact, it wasn't, you know, Peter uh, uh, wrote that some people get messed up, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, because of Paul's writings and Paul's teaching. He never said that about James. So way back when, they were already having problems with people. 2,000 years ago, they were having problems with people misunderstanding the things Paul said, not what James said. So the reality of it is, and please, I don't believe this, but the reality of it is then based on what the Word of God actually says, including what Peter alludes to, if any books were taken out of the Bible, it should have been Paul. Now we know that's false. They all fit in there and they all work together. We, the contradictions that we sometimes think are there are only in us, in our lack of understanding, not actually in the Word of God. So keep that in mind when you come across this or you hear people say this. And quite frankly, you hear somebody say something on that level, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to be blunt and honest. That's carnality, that's flesh, and you just need to turn those people off because they're not teaching or they're not led by the Spirit. 
And that's just the reality of it. If they can't understand, James is in there, and James is speaking to you, I, and that, you and I, and that is Bible, Word of God, Heart of God for us today. Just turn them off. It's that simple. Okay, let's get back to this. Get off my soapbox now. So verse 15. Um, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Remember, there's that word profit again. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now, if you and I were to you know, get together, sit down and talk about this thing, we would, I think all of us would agree that, that God, our God is so big. We have faith that our God is so big, so powerful, so wonderful, <clears throat> that he could take care of all the poor people in the world. He could clothe all the naked people in the world. And he could even empower us to do that very thing. Right? We have faith in that. Okay, we have faith that God is big. He can take care of people. He can take care of the poor. He can feed the hungry. All that good stuff, right? So let's keep that in mind as we look at this again. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of de daily food, and one of you says, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give him the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It doesn't matter that we believe our God is big and our God is a provider and our God wants to feed people and clothe people. It doesn't matter that we know that he's loving enough and, and loves people enough to do that for them. It doesn't matter if we're not willing to put action to what we say we believe. Remember, we are God's hands and feet in the earth. When God wants to feed somebody that's hungry, he does it through us. When he wants to clothe somebody that's naked and cold, he does it through us. When he wants uh, um, to, to share his love to people, he does it primarily through us. I'm not saying he doesn't do anything supernaturally, but we are the natural to his super. So, <clears throat> you know, it's one thing to say, oh, yeah, God loves these people. He can heal everybody. He can touch everybody. He can feed everybody. Yeah, he's that great but we don't go out to do it. We're not partnering with them. Our faith is dead and it doesn't profit or do anybody any good. It doesn't bring any righteous increase to anybody. And so what James is saying is like you guys, you, you, you're saying, you know, you, you know that God is big. You know, he's great. You know, he's awesome. You know, he's all powerful. Now put hands and feet to it and go take it to people. Don't just say or just pray, Lord, bless them. You go bless them. Oh, Lord, fill their empty bellies. No, go feed them. Oh, Lord, get them warm clothes for the winter. No, give them a jacket. You see, by doing that, we're putting action, a corresponding action to what we already say we have faith in. We have faith in God that he's going to do these things. So now let's put an action to it. And that's what James is getting. And just do what you say you believe. Put feet to it. That's why if you believe that God is a healer, go lay hands on the sick. If you believe that God will, 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 can show you things about people's future and you can prophesy, well, go do it. You see, see what I'm saying? Put action to what you say you believe. And this is what James is getting to. <clears throat> so uh, let me read this. In this portion, James brings the discussion into light in a manner that everyone can understand. We can claim that we have faith in God and that God is good, but if we don't show that God is good by what we do, our faith is dead. Verbally blessing someone or praying for them only when we have the resources to actually help that person, this type of so-called faith is dead. Dead because it produces nothing. No life is attached to this type of faith. <clears throat> but putting action to our faith produces life. Regardless of what we say we have faith in, we must put feet to our faith and produce life. So you see, uh, James, James speaks of this, this faith and this work and his action in regard to our salvation, as we saw earlier, but also just down to the simple, average, ordinary, everyday thing of feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. So whether it be your salvation or doing acts of kindness and showing the love of God, we need to put faith to what we say we believe in. 
Okay, let, let's look at verse 18. <clears throat> it says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. Once again, James cuts through the clutter and takes his discussion in a direction that most everyone can understand. It's not enough to say, I have faith, <laughs> nor is it enough to say, I have works. We are to have both. We are to have faith in God, and this faith is to lead us to action in accordance with that faith. So he says, someone will say, uh, you have faith, I have works. You know, the reality of it is, again, we, we can't make that distinction since it's very clear from Scripture. We are to have both. We are to have faith in God, and that faith in God is to lead us to do something in alignment with what we say we have faith in. So, you know, I will, we have to learn to show people our faith with our works. Show them how much we love God and them with our works of love, taking care of them. Verse 19 goes on to say, you believe there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. I love this because James seems to make almost a poke fun or make a, a, a seemingly a joke out of this because there's those who will arrogantly brag about their faith in God. I have faith in God. You know, my faith is solid and I'm a word of, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but he points out and he puts people in their place by telling them that, you know what, um, you say you believe that there is one God. Nah, you do well. But even demons believe I mean, he takes it right down to this fallen being, hell-bound creature that even they believe and they tremble. They might not have a corresponding work because they're not saved, but they at least have the work in the sense of this action of trembling and fear because of their understanding of who God is. And so he was, he was contrasting the demons that are the furthest away from God at least tremble and fear at the idea, the mention, or the thought of God when his own people brag, like, I've got faith in God. And he's making this contrast. Yeah, you, you do well, but demons know that too, and they tremble. So he's, he's constantly pushing this and constantly making this, but what are you going to do about it? You say, but what are you going to do? You say you have faith, but what are you going to do? What can you show me that proves you have faith? <clears throat> Verse 20 goes, goes on to say, but do you not know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? He keeps pushing this, pushing this, pushing this. Faith without works is dead. The only works, uh, again, that demons do in this relationship is tremble and fear. We, of course, are to do far more than merely tremble, <clears throat> but we must do something that is in alignment with our faith. Why? Because it doesn't matter how much faith you think you have, doesn't matter how much inward recognition or idea or thought or belief you have if it doesn't have an outward expression. What's going on in inside benefits nobody, but what you put into action can benefit many, many, many people. Um, let's look, read verse 21 through 24. Was not Abraham our father justified? Now we get back to what we were saying earlier. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Again, he had to put action. In other words, he had to be obedient to the voice of God. He already had faith. He already had a relationship with him. He was already a friend of God. Now God says, offer your son. And he had to be obedient and put action to that request. And that proved that he had faith in God. So, um, and, and again, we pointed this out uh, in verse 14. Abraham was justified by faith, but his faith was expressed through a work or an action. Again, Abraham believed God, which caused him to be obedient to God by sacrificing his son on the altar. 
I know I'm harping on this. I know I'm repeating myself. I know I'm pushing this because James keeps saying it over and over and over again. If it was something that was that important for James to write over and over again, it's something important for me to say to you over and over again. <clears throat> Verse 25, we'll wrap this up. Verse 25 and 26. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? You see, justified by works uh, when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So he takes it back uh, and he's, he, another place. James is talking about Abraham and his faithfulness to God and doing what God asked him to do. And that was the proof of his faith. He also shows Rahab the harlot. Remember, she was the one that when the spies were sent into the land, uh, uh, it was at Jericho. Her house was on the wall of Jericho. And when they came to hide because the men of the city were looking for them, they, she hid them away and then sent them out another way. And, and uh, she made them promise, I'll hide you, but protect me and my family when you guys come to destroy the, uh, the uh, city. So she had to have some type of faith that they would keep their word and faith that it was all going to work out the way she had hoped and that they would be, uh, and she and her household would be saved. She had to have faith. So she put her faith into action by hiding them and making sure that they got out of the city uh, safely. So sometimes it's that simple. Sometimes it comes right down to something like that. But nonetheless, she put action, she put work, a work to what she already believed. She knew that these Israelites were going to come and destroy the city. She knew that. She had that. That's where her faith was. Her understanding, her belief was there. And she wanted salvation. So she made them promise and she put actions to it by helping them get out safely. But again, um, James closes up this chapter by saying, for as the body without the spirit is dead. In other words, if you take your spirit out of your body, your, your, your body is dead. The spirit is the real life of your body. So faith without works is dead. It's like faith is the body, but the works is the spirit that gives the body, the faith, life. In other words, you just don't see it. It's not animated. It's not working until you do something with it. Now, James drives this home through this whole entire chapter. Faith without works is dead. Put, put action to what you say you believe. Work it out. Abraham did it. Rahab did it. You know, you have to do it even in your salvation and in your salvation. What do you have to do in your salvation? What kind of work do you do for salvation? First, you believe God. And that really is the salvation that you receive. But if you're truly saved, you'll put action to it by living for him, walking it out, doing what he says, learning to be obedient to him, pressing into him in prayer, supplications and such, going to church, reading the Bible. These are all types of works that you do, not necessarily for the salvation per se, but it's proof that you are saved and it's because you're saved that you do these things. Same thing with Rahab, same thing with Abraham, and same things with anything in life. The businessman goes into business or develops a product and begins to sell it because he has faith that he can do that and people will buy it. The faith was already there. Now he's putting action to it and putting it on the market. Uh, the farmer has faith that he's going to have a harvest you know, at the end of the season, so he does the work of planting the seed. He doesn't plant the seed and then go, I don't think it's going to grow. Or he would never have do it. Or, or, or he would never plant it. But he plants it. He does the corresponding work because he knows, he has faith, that, that once that seed is planted, it will germinate, it will grow, and he'll have a harvest. In other words, he's, he's doing it with the end in mind. So it's the same thing with you and I. We have to learn to put action continually to what we say we believe. If we really honestly believe it, we'll put action to it. It's that simple. Uh, and, and that's on everything, whether it be finances, our salvation, our relationship with people, our relationship with God, uh, the way we treat other people, non-believers, the hungry, the cold, the naked, no matter who it is. Uh, our, our, true, our true faith is going to be revealed in what we do or don't do. So think about it. Think about that in regards to these different things that, that we could see, you can see in yourself, you can see in others, we can see in you, really where your faith lies by what you do, not just what you say or what you claim, 
but by what you do. That's the greatest indication of where your faith really is. Okay, so keep that in mind as we go through this. We're through chapter 2, and uh, our next study will start at the top of chapter 3. And I really appreciate you guys checking in with me. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you again.